Hello everyone, this lecture is on spore forming microorganisms. Um, first, to start talking about bacterial stress, um, as you may understand, when you have a microorganism and that microorganism is changed from one environment to the other, that causes a lot of stress in the bacterial cell. Think about a bacteria, for example, being inside the GI tract of an animal. When that bacteria is released to the environment, that causes a stress because it's changing from a specific temperature or pH condition or uh, some uh, nutritional um, conditions to a new environment. It's the same if that microorganism enters a, to a food pro process processing facility. Uh, that might also cause some stress because conditions will be different. Now that bacteria may go through a food, again, conditions will be different. Perhaps that food will be uh, refrigerated, that food may contain some ingredients that will try to inhibit bacteria. And also when that um, the food is being consumed by, uh, by humans, uh, think also of the stress that is being caused to that bacteria now going to the GI tract of the host with completely different conditions, perhaps a pH that is very low and also uh, nutrients that are very different from the, 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 the previous conditions. So all of those changes typically cause a lot of stress in microorganisms. And as a response to, response to that stress, Bacteria uses, use very uh, different mechanisms. For example, one of those mechanisms is known as the heat shock stress or the heat shock response. There is also called a uh, shock response. And these are just some mechanisms that bacteria use to respond to stress. Um, other examples also can be activation of motility. I don't know if you remember when we discussed salmonella, salmonella uses two different uh, flagella phases and they're able to change from, from H1 to H2 flagella as a response of any stressful conditions. Some of this, them also may synthesize um, uh, some antibiotics as well. And uh, again, these are some examples of stress response. This is in general, and each type of microorganism will respond differently depending on the genetic um, uh, uh, makeup or uh, depending on the different circumstances. Now, there is this specific group of microorganisms which are the spore-forming bacteria. This group of bacteria will form a specific structure that is called endospores. And the endospore is um, a mechanism used by this group of bacteria um, as a response to survive mainly starvation. Uh, it is a stressor also, but mainly a starvation. Now, I want to clarify something. If you have a vegetative cell, a vegetative cell, let's write here this term, vegetative cell, is a bacteria that is in normal state. If you apply heat, let's say that you, you heat a food at 70 degrees Celsius, uh, that vegetative cell will die. So that doesn't mean that you can never kill um, spore-forming microorganisms. So the cells in this form, in vegetative cell form, they will die if you apply uh, any uh, sort of killing step um, or mechanism, killing, uh, any killing steps, such as heat or acid but mainly starvation is going to cause this bacteria to form the endospore. Now endospores are structures. Endospore 
are a specific structure that is formed by this group of microorganisms. In terms of spore forming bacteria and the food industry, we are concerned about three uh, microorganisms. These three microorganisms are all gram positives. So these are the spore forming, are all gram positive. These three bacteria are Clostridium perfringens, uh, botulinum, sorry, Clostridium perfringens, and Bacillus cereus, or B cereus. And the main concern is uh, having them in a spore state. Um, and after they are in that state, you can apply heat or any other type of um, healing mechanism and it will be more difficult to destroy them. Now, uh, some of them might be anaerobes. Bacillus is not anaerobe. Bacillus is an anaerobe microorganism. It's an aerobic microorganism. Clostridium botulinum is anaerobic. anaerobic. Perfringent also is an anaerobic microorganism. So depending on these conditions, you may associate or you might be concerned with different type of food products. For example, canning industry. When you're canning a product, and we have a, here an example in this picture, you're canning a product, you're expecting that canning um, process to remove all the air. Uh, so any anaerobic microorganism will be able to survive there. Now, if you have any other food that is not processed under anaerobic conditions, so you can easily have uh, Bacillus cereus, and if you have spores there, those spores will survive cooking or any other treatment. Now, not all spore-forming microorganisms are pathogens. There is a group of microorganisms, or there are several genus of microorganisms that are not food foodborne pathogens, and they are mainly associated with spoilage. And this is an example, sporolactobacillus, anoxide, bacillus, geobacillus, and, and some other microorganisms. So these are not foodborne pathogens. They only cause spoilage. Um, once the microorganism enters through this, uh, or go through this starvation process, it becomes a stress. So those, and several conditions here will cause the microorganism to go in a dormancy state or cause the microorganism to sporulate. When the conditions are favorable to the bacteria, they will revert from spore state to a vegetative cell state. Okay, so if the microorganism is, has a sporulated, um, as we have mentioned, it produces or it forms what we call the endospores. Endospores is because is the spore is formed inside the microorganism. Now, please do not confuse endospore or sporulating uh, in bacteria with the sporulation in molds, for example. It's a process completely different. Um, so the endospores it, it are a dormant form of the microorganisms. They're uh, bacteria which are in the form of a spore or spores are enzymatically inert form of those vegetative cells. Uh, but they will always preserve the genetic material because the spores ultimately are carrying or preserving that uh, DNA inside the cells. Now, if you want to sporulate a bacteria in the lab, you can do it. There are different type of media that we use to sporulate microorganisms. For example, we work sometimes with Clostridium perfringens. Uh, so we acquire the vegetative cells and we uh, transfer those cells to different media that will cause not the death of the cells, but will cause the sporulation. If you heat the cells 
at temperatures over 70, you will kill those cells. So if you want to sporulate them, mainly you need the, the starvation. That's kind of the main stressor. Um, the, um, uh, the sporulation process typically happens when the cells are in stationary phase. Stationary phase, I'm sorry, I'm writing this. When the cells are in station, stationary phase. So just remember, I'm going to make a very small drawing here. Remember the um, growth curve. This is your lag phase. This is the log phase, and this is the stationary phase, and then. Right, so when the cells enter stationary phase is when they are going to sporulate. And of course, if they are multiplying here during the log phase, that means all of the nutrients are available. So it doesn't make sense for the spores for the cells to sporulate in during the log phase. During the log phase, again, they have all of the nutrients available. So once they go to a stationary phase, they will uh, sporulate. That's kind of one of the main um, the main things of entering to a sporulation phase. Once that bacteria enter into that phase and become an endospore, that sporulation will provide protection against ultraviolet radiation, desiccation, high temperature, extreme freezing in some chemical uh, disinfectants or chemical ingredients that may be added to the food. Now let's review the sporulation process. And so here you will see the description. It's a brief description. I'm going to provide more information. So I would like you to take notes to complement this information. There are seven steps involved in sporulation. And we have seven, seven steps of sporulation. And let's move on to this little graph here to explain what those steps of sporulation are. So the first step between this and this, these are kind of both step number one. So the main activity that is happening here is there is a chromosome uh, division or chromosome replication. So the cell is, the, the chromosome is divided in two and the cell stretches. So you see a cell that is smaller and then when there is this uh, first stage, it's kind of the cell stretches a little bit, it's more elongated, and then you will see the two different chromosomes. And those two chromosomes will stay, will stay within the cell because part of that is going to be the mother cell and part of that chromosome is going to be um, in the um, spore. Okay, so also within this phase two, the cell needs to make a decision of where the spore is going to be formed. So it's kind of a, um, an, uh, it's just a, a process in which the, the, the cell is going to, to decide, okay, where do I want to form my, my spore, here or, or here? So which uh, pole of the cell I'm going? So there is something called a septum formation. But ultimately, it will be formed, the spore will be formed only in one side of the cell. Okay, then during the stage two, what is happening here is the cell is divided now into mother cell and four spore. You see the term here, four spore. So four spore is what's going to be the spore or endospore. Phase two, the cell is divided into molar cell and four spore, and approximately 30% of that chromosome is 
in of that chromosome is in the four spore side. Uh, now that um, chromosome here is very condensed, it's very um, it's kind of like tight in a small space, and uh, eventually uh, the rest of the chromosome is going to be pumped into the four spore side. Um, okay, now on stage three, this one here, and I'm going to delete this, explain better. During the stage three, let's use a different color. What is going to happen is the mother cell will engulf the spore. So this is the engulfment of the spore. And this is going to result in the four spore being kind of surrounded by two complete membranes. And it's going to look like a free cell into, into a cell. So if you see this membrane here and this other membrane here. So this four spore is going to be kind of, uh, it's going to have more layers here. So this is the engulfment of that four spore by the mother cell. Now on a stage four, uh, then the mother cell chromosome will be destroyed. And this is kind of this transition here. Stage four, that chromosome is going to be destroyed. And here you'll see that it has disappeared. So there's no chromosome of the mother cell. So mother cell, mother cell chromosome is destroyed. mother cell chromosome is destroyed. This is what's happening in that stage four and actually a lot of things happen between the stage four and stage five. All of this is, is a transition process where different um, codes are going to be formed here. So one of those activities that is going to happen here during this uh, stage four is also the formation of the cortex. Um, the cortex is a large peptidoglycan -like -like structure. I want to write it here, cortex is peptidoglycan -like structure or PG. Um, and that's going to provide a lot of protection to that DNA once the, the spore is completely formed. So that peptidoglycan structure is laid down between the inner and the outer four spore membranes. Um, the cortex is going to be very important in heat resistance and also maintaining the dormancy of the spore. So that's why that cortex is, is very important here. Um, later on when it's in a spore later on in a spore related form. Uh, the spore form also between this uh, stage four and five is kind of happening between these two stages. Between the stage four and five it's also going to form or synthesize different molecules. There will be production of glucose dehydrogenase and also there will be a production of something that is called the SASP and we will mention this several times these are small acid soluble proteins Those are the SASP. So the SASP and uh, that glucose, glucose dehydrogenase is going to be produced or formed during that stage four and kind of in a transition to stage five. Um, so that thick layer is going to be created here initiating that stage five. The thick layer is going to be composed of all of these uh, proteins. That's a code that is going to be deposited there, but the code is synthesized by the spore. And those codes will provide a lot of protection to that cell. 
uh, so that all happens between stage four and stage three. I mentioned that code synthesis. During the stage six, then we'll see what we call the maturation. The maturation is, is, is the, the final step in becoming a spore. Within that final step, I wanted to write this here, during the final step of maturation, maturation something important that is happening here is that this spore will produce something called dipicolinic acid dipicolinic acid or known also as the dpa dpa dipicolinic acid and that's the final process of the core uh, dehydration so the spores now has become metabolic metabolically dormant and acquires further chemical resistance and heat resistance and that's in part uh, due to the um, production of the dipicolinic acid as well and now finally during the stage four a uh, uh, seven I'm sorry stage seven or phase seven the molar cell which is also called a sporangium, the mother cell will release the mature spore. And to release uh, that spore, the cell has to do something and it's an auto destruction. So it will produce auto lysins. Auto lysins. So the mother cell produces auto lysins. And those auto lysins will cause uh, a destruction or lysis of, of itself. It's an enzymatic destruction. And that's how that mother cell will release the spore. So as you can see, sporulation is not a reproductive process. It's just a formation of a structure to preserve that DNA by the cell. I have added a video here, a link to a video, and I encourage you to watch this video because it's going to help again and repeat uh, all of these steps. It's going to help understanding uh, the same steps that I just mentioned. So I really think it will be important for you to watch that video. It's very short. It's about three minutes or something like that. Now the spore is formed and the different structures and the different um, uh, uh, components of the spores will confirm, uh, will confer different type of protection. So it's, if you see these different layers here, uh, these external layers, these external layers, you have layers and layers and layers and layers. So you will see, um, kind of more protection as you get close to the core. This is the core where is where the DNA is stored. So as you get closer to the core, there will be more protection. Now let's review some of the structure and what they do to protect the, the, the cell or to protect the DNA. The exosporium is the most external structure is going to help protecting that spore or protecting that DNA uh, against large molecules. So think of that spore being in a just given environment surrounded by different type of substances. Could be water, could be antibiotics, could be just any type of substance. Uh, so the exosporium will protect that spore from the um, introduction of large molecule, for example, antibodies. Now we have a spore codes. If you remember, those spore codes are the ones that were formed during the stage four and a stage five. And the spore codes are comprised of proteins that are more or less semi different type of proteins uh, composing that those, those codes that are there. And these proteins are very unique to the spores. 
Now, something very important about these codes is that it's going to protect that peptidoglycan uh, from attack by lytic enzymes. And remember, what is the peptidoglycan? Is the cortex. So that the the codes will protect the cortex against lytic enzymes and against some chemical attack. Now we have the cortex here. This is the cortex, and the cortex will be that large PG uh, layer or peptidoglycan layer, and it's going to help the sport with resistance to heat and also. It will help uh, the core or the sport with the dehydration. Um, I'm going to mention later that the amount of water in a sport is much lower uh, compared to the amount of water in a vegetative cell. We have also this germ wall cell wall, and this structure located here is very similar or identical to the veget vegetative cell wall. So it is believed that this may have to do with uh, the outgrowth process when the cell, when the spore goes back to the vegetative cell form. So this germ cell wall may be part of that uh, vegetative cell structure. Um, we have also the inner forespore membrane. This inner forespore membrane is going to protect uh, um, also that DNA is a very strong permeability barrier and is going to slow the entry of almost all molecules, including water, into the spore core. And of course, the spore core is very important because it's where the DNA is going to be um, store as well. Okay. Now I have here this slide that I decided to um, leave this for you so you can uh, complete and describe all of these uh, different structures and take notes in the future if you want or during this recording. Um, now let's talk about the endospore. So once that endospore is formed, um, as I mentioned uh, when I explained the different steps of sporulation, that endospore is going to be released uh, to the environment. Right? And you can see in this picture, this will be the, the little spores that are released. These are the little, little spores. Um, and once those free spores or endospores are placing placed in an environment that will support growth, they will revert back to vegetative cells. So usually this environment must contain something we call germinants. So those germinants can be any substance that will be useful for the microorganism or a combination of those could be amino acids or any other type of substance. Now, again, I just mentioned this earlier, but I want to repeat this again. You should uh, keep in mind that is the sporulation is not a reproductive process. It's not a reproductive process. It's a process of differentiation in which the microorganism is just protecting its DNA. There are differences between the spore and a vegetative cells. Um, and I have a table just under this slide. Some of the most important differences between these two is one of these is the water content. So for example, within the core of the spore, there is a very little amount of water. So it is estimated approximately four point grams of water, of water of dry weight within the, the, the core of the spore. While the veget vegetative cell is going to have approximately four grams of water per each gram of dry weight. Now, in terms of molecules, the, the molecules that are within the spore or are, are uh, making the spore are different 
to the molecules that you will find in a vegetative cell. So for example, this SASP proteins, if you remember, this a SASP are the small acid soluble proteins. You will not see them in the cell or in a very, very small quantity. Also, that large uh, peptidoglycan layer, which is in the, 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 the core, is another difference, or the large amount of DPA or dipicolinic acid in the spore is very low in cells. Uh, the spores will be metabolically dormant, so the spore itself in, in, in that state, they will not be able to multiply, reproduce, nothing, or they cannot metabolize, they cannot use any nutrient, nothing, because remember, nothing is going to come inside, so they have to uh, outgrow, or, or they have to germinate and then outgrow, um, outgrow to be able to start uh, utilizing the nutrients. So during the spore um, uh, state, they will be metabolically dormant and nothing is going to happen, no activity whatsoever is going to happen. And because of that, they will survive heat, heat radiation, freezing, high uh, pressure chemicals, and also all of those layers that we mentioned are going to protect the spore. In this table, you can see differences between the cells and the spores. So if you observe these type of molecules that are here, these are usually the molecules associated with a usual, a, a, a typical living cell. So you can see that the uh, concentration in cells is usually much higher and is much lower in the spores. Now let's see this, DPA. See how the DPA or dipicolinic acid is much higher within a spore than um, a regular cell. So there are, of course, not just the structural differences, but differences in terms of the small molecules that are uh, being part of the cells. Okay, now let's discuss a little bit the spore position and spore morphology. And this is simple, as you can see. Let's focus on this picture here. As you can see in this picture, there are different positions for the spore. So you can have a central spore, which is number one, and number four. These are central spores. Then we have terminal endospores. And the terminal endospores will be this number two, or number three, or number five. And lateral, which is different is this number six. And the location of that spore, the shape and the position will depend on the species. So I have a picture here of two microorganisms, two sporulated microorganisms. We have Bacillus subtilis. You can see the position of the spore is kind of central. And if you can observe here, I think it's kind of central. And here we have Clostridium botulinum seen in green so you see the, the position of the spore so let's go back a little bit here to this drawing so i think this clostridium botulinum is going to be kind of the number three which is a terminal endospore so it's always um, depending on the microorganism that that position of the spore now we review the steps to sporulate but the cycle between being a spore or germinating to become a vegetative cell is different. So to become a, a, a microorganism that is in sporulated form, so let's say this is the spore or endospore, the process for this microorganism to become again a vegetative cell involves two main steps and there are many other uh, steps and, and things that happen at a molecular level but we are going to discuss only this these two one step is germination and the other step is called the outgrowth um, the germination is a transformation process and the spore is going to lose all of the dpa so germination 
there is loss of the DPA. Remember what DPA is? It's the dipiclinic acid. And this DPA is going to be lost by, uh, just by excretion. And also they're going to lose all of the proteins. So these proteins are going to be uh, lost by degradation. So there is degradation of the proteins and there will be just excretion of the DPA. Excretion of the DPA. Uh, so that's happening during germination. So it's just a transformation process. And during germination, you will not see really any metabolism. It's just going to start, but still you don't see any, any metabolism per se. Now we have the outgrowth, the outgrowth and the outgrowth follows germination uh, and that's going to be the synthesis of molecules that are essential uh, to the microorganism and with during the outgrowth uh, now we can see the um, microorganism is going to start metabolizing carbohydrates it's going to synthesize RNA synthesize of, of course proteins um, amino acids nucleotides and there will be a DNA repair You'll see DNA repair and synthesis of different uh, molecules. And I have here a description of those two steps that I just mentioned. Um, okay, so this is the difference between what is germination and what is uh, outgrowth, which are the two main steps in the uh, process to become a vegetative cell okay now we have a spores in the food industry and what happens what is the implication of having a spores in food or in the food industry uh, well we mentioned the concern of these three main microorganisms clostridium perfringens clostridium botulinum and Bacillus cereus or B cereus, these three uh, are foodborne pathogens. So if you have a food with a spore of any of these three, it will be very difficult to kill them. Or if you are, if you have food at home or a restaurant and that food contains any of these uh, spores, just the regular heating, the, the, the regular uh, uh, warming up or, or heating or cooking is not going to kill these spores. Uh, now, there would be an opportunity for these microorganisms where they have maybe a germinant and they will be reverting back to vegetative cells and cause illnesses. Uh, if you might have heard, I'm pretty sure, you might have heard botulinum, botul botulinum, or botulism, um, and this microorganism can cause death very rapidly. Now there are other f uh, um, uh, four spore, uh, uh, spore forming microorganisms that are associated with the sp uh, polish of food. And of course, this is a concern because nobody wants to, or the food industry don't want to get their food spoiled. Some of these spoilish microorganisms or genus that uh, we're mentioning here uh, they can uh, spoil dairy products they can uh, spoil uh, protein type of products like meat products so of course it's not a desirable characteristics and because of that uh, because of that not because of the spoilage but because of the um, implication in foodborne illnesses, there are regulations pertaining the prevention of these microorganisms in food. Now, this following slide is going to describe spoilage by different type of microorganisms that are spore forming. Uh, so, for example, can food can be spoiled by spore forming? And you can see the different microorganisms here. These are the major spore-forming microorganisms that will cause spoilage in canned food. And you can see a different type of spoilage, flat sour, thermophilic, 
NRO is going to cause be uh, to cause also the can that swells or may burst different type of changes and so you can see this um, problems that will be associated with these microorganisms and the, the defects uh, that will be caused. So don't think that only swelling is the only spoilage of cans. You can see uh, different type of uh, problems. You can see you're in flat cans or you can see just change in flavor and uh, nobody wants to uh, take the risk and eat a product that is a spoil because you don't know if there can be a pathogen present in that food. Now with that said, the main industry that is concerned with this um, spore related microorganism is the canning uh, industry. So can industry or canned uh, uh, low acid foods by law and there is this FDA regulation here by law they need to receive a 12D reduction 12D is the same as 12 log reduction I want to write it down again 12 12 log reduction of course of these microorganisms that we're talking so during the canning process FDI FDA requires this type of industry to ensure that the thermal processing that includes temperature and pressure will be sufficient to destroy 12 logs of that microorganism. They also need to demonstrate commercial sterility and this is a condition achieved by application of heat sufficient alone or in combination with other ingredients or treatments to render the product free of microorganisms that are capable of growing in the product at non-refrigerated conditions at which that product is going to be held during distribution of storage. So that is this is the concept of commercial sterility. And just notice that word commercial. So they're not expecting full sterility. Um, also, another concern for the food industry is uh, for the low acid canned food. The, uh, the, the low acid canned food are those food products that have a pH greater than 4.6. And they, uh, during this, uh, the processing of this type of product, they expect that the thermal process will destroy the spores because uh, this pH may support the growth of microorganism. And I want to clarify something here, and I am mentioning this, I'm going to use a different color. This note here. So the food industry, in terms of um, pH, they classify the food into acidified and low acid. So if the pH is greater than 4.6, that food is going to be considered low acid. Uh, and because the level of acid is, is not that great, right? So it's low. And if the food has a pH that is less or equal 2.6, that food is going to be acidified food. So this, it's important to understand uh, uh, because the regulations are written depending on the type of industry. So if you have this food, that has this pH again that is greater, greater than 4.6 they expect the thermal process to be sufficient to kill this bacteria and it's a big deal in the industry and for acidified foods usually the thermal process is targeting the vegetative cells because the spores will not be able to grow or germinate at this pH that are very low now Within uh, this scanning industry, if you were a microbiologist that is being hired to help them uh, either as a consultant or as an employee, within this scanning industry, uh, they must or they uh, or it is very important for them, them to conduct something that is called the thermal dead time test. And these are uh, tests conducted in the lab to make sure that the thermal process or that treatment that can be a combination of 
pressure and temperature is sufficient. Now, this test, they need to be uh, conducted by specific la laboratories and the instrumentation and equipment used for this TDT test are going to include retorts, tubes or cans and free neck flask and their other type of equipment that you need to use and also you need to be trained, have a specific training to get this test performed. Uh, so you as a microbiologist, if you have an expertise in food microbiology, microbiology you will be able to uh, uh, help conducting this type of test in the labs. Now within this thermal dead time test, test, you can do two different type of tests and we have talked about the D value. So they usually like to determine the D value and the Z value. Now, we'll have a lecture later on, I think will be one of the last lectures where we will discuss this. So for now, I just want to explain what this is, but it's not really going to be uh, tested or evaluated. But so for us to understand the D value is the time at a particular temperature that we need to kill one log of those microorganisms. The Z value is given in terms of the degrees that you need to reduce one log. So how many degrees you need to reduce one log in, in the time, of course, is important. So that that is, is all and that's going to cover uh, spore forming microorganisms. And please email me if you have any questions.